It's and somebody from Scouts. Come to their faith. Yes. And at their faith in various ways. I had a friend of mine say to me once, well, I believe Grandpa. Uh, because it's better than the other alternative. Yes. And I thought, well, while an honest comment, I thought that was kind of a curious path to faith. But like she said, works for me, she says. So who am I to say? We all know people with what we call the childlike faith. These are people who uh, seem to have always believed. They, they don't doubt. They don't question. They just live their lives this way. And I've always uh, envied, admired, marveled at people with this faith. Like I do patient people. I mean, uh, maybe there's a connection there. <laughs> also, sometimes uh, people try to reason their way in. I mean, and we're told that... Uh, uh, that reason and faith are mutually exclusive. I mean, you can't have faith and reason at the same time, can you? But you can't say this to people like uh, C.S. Lewis, for example. Uh, he was an avowed agnostic, uh, a renowned philosopher and logician. And he railed against Christianity for years. Uh, but he could not figure out where joy came from. Uh, he, he, fin he, he finally wrote a book about that. He couldn't figure out where uh, compassion came from. I mean, <clears throat> the notion of somebody thinking about someone else uh, before themselves in any situation uh, was absurd. Uh, it wasn't natural, normal. It's not part of the human condition. But it exists. So where did it come from? Ultimately, he made an astounding comment in his book, Mere Christianity, when he said, he came to this conclusion, either Jesus Christ was a son of God or he was a raving lunatic, he writes. Uh, he seems to have arrived at his faith through reason. And I've, I've used this comment many times when I've ever had a lingering doubt about some aspect of, uh, of my own faith and poof, my faith is intact and I, and I move on and can say what my friend said works for me. So uh, it's hard to judge. It's, it's impossible to judge people uh, with their level of faith or how they arrived at it. We're to the journey part. And in a, if any of you get bored listening to the life story of someone you barely know or don't know at all, uh, like I think I might, <laughs> uh, then I suggest you just sort of visit your own journey uh, while I'm going through mine. Everybody has a story. Uh, everybody has hundreds of stories within their story. My journey has been a very bumpy one, uh, but a very blessed one along the way, and that's not unique. Uh, as a child, I had no exposure whatsoever uh, to church, religion, faith, Sunday school, Jesus, nothing. Uh, we had a family that descended into chaos early. Uh, it was beyond dysfunction, it was destructive, uh, and it was abusive. And it was not a good environment for a child of any age. Consequently, I spent some time with my first earth angel, and that was my grandmother. She took me to her church. It was a Christian science church. And it was, it was this dark and foreboding place in downtown Portland. And I would sit there in a sea of old people, and now I am an old people, and, and listen to somebody extol the, the musings of Mary Baker Eddy. And it was hard enough for an adult to understand, let alone uh, a third grader. I went to seven different elementary schools. I learned to box uh, because I had to fight my way into every school and every neighborhood. When I was a, a freshman in high school, I told my father, I'm not moving again because I don't want to change schools. When I was a sophomore, sure enough, we moved and they said I'd have to change schools. So one morning I gathered up everything I owned. I, I threw it in my 41 Buick. <clears throat> I was 15 at a time, almost 16, and I abandoned ship. Uh, my mother had left three years before. I hadn't seen her for a couple of years. And anyway, I went to school that morning with no other plan than I will live in my car and I will eat in the school cafeteria. I mean, such is the wisdom of a 16-year-old. Of a 
Very soon, I was introduced to my next Earth Angels because they, the officials frowned on a juvenile delinquent camping in front of their school. Now, these people were to become my unofficial foster parents. I moved in. And I'm not really exaggerating very much when I say, in the blink of an eye, I was baptized, confirmed, singing in the church choir. We were doing devotions in the morning. I had tasks and structure. I had three square meals a day, a roof over my head. And I was with a family that laughed and played together and functioned. I mean, you know, what a concept. And I thrived there, but I only lived with them for a year and a half. Oh, that's another story. Uh, when I was a senior, I lived in a sleazy motel uh, and uh, uh, virtually by myself. And I know it sounds weird, but, uh, you know, I was, the, I was the envy of my classmates. You know, I was free at last. Uh, well, it wasn't a good thing, actually. Uh, I had plans then to go to Oregon State and wrestle there. But my foster parents, uh, who had a huge influence on me, guided me uh, north to the monastery up there called Pacific Lutheran. <laughs> I'm sorry, Dave, wherever you are. At any rate, to make a long story short, while I had never had any trouble academically, and it came easy to me, and that was probably unfortunate, uh, I was not, this is a quote, I was not a good fit behaviorally, according to the dean of students there. <laughs> I was on probation my second week of school, and when I went to, when I graduated, when I went into the registrar's office to settle my account to get my degree, the registrar, who I happened to go to school with and knew, said, Mike, do you realize you have never been off probation? <laughs> I did not know that. <laughs> And I'm not proud to say that I graduated from Pacific Lutheran with dishonor removed. <laughs> okay, from there, I taught school, coached football and wrestling. And then I was in the financial planning business for 25 years and retired early. That was also unfortunate because I almost drank myself to death. Uh, and fortunately, that has been over for over 20 years now. We've been members here for 40 years. And uh, this has been like family to us. And I've, and I've known dozens and dozens of Earth Angels who have moved in and out of here and who linger here still. Uh, we're very grateful to be part of, of this community. Okay, that, now we're to the story. Both of these stories are about perspective. And it's the kind of perspective where you get a glimpse of your life in the context of the lives of others. Both of these stories, I believe, have their basis in the old postulate, uh, we have met the enemy and the enemy is us. Uh, and in this case, it's me. Because of time restraints, I, I'm only gonna tell one story this morning. Uh, the, the second story, and for, and for another reason, I can't make it through the second story without uh, breaking down, so. And nobody wants to see that, especially me. Anyway, the first story took, took place 16 years ago. My oldest grandson was one year old, and Patty was going to go down to Salem and help our daughter out with the, with the youngster. That means I, was being, I, was, I would be left alone to fend for myself in my own briar patch. Oh, my, what will I do? You know, woe is me. And before she was out of sight, I was making plans for the evening. Uh, and someone had told me about the buffet up at the Skagit Casino. Uh, so I thought, well, I'm going to go up there and I'm going to engorge myself with all the foodstuffs. And then I, I'm going to try my luck at the One-Armed Bandit. So um, and my evening of, of hedonistic revelry was set. <laughs> An hour before my departure, I got a phone call from Ruth Holmes. And Ruth is asking me to take her place to serve, uh, to help Jennifer, our, our ex-pastor, to help Jennifer serve down at Friendship House. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I think. I didn't even have time to, you know, use the old stall and say, well, uh, let, me, uh, let me think about it and get back to you. That, didn't, that, that, didn't, that was not in play. <laughs> and I am there. Uh, struggling mentally, I'm fragmented. I, I'm got, 
I've got hedonistic revelry on this hand, or feed the hungry. <laughs> okay, what, what choice did I have? I didn't have a choice. So, with uh, shattered expectations and a lot of resentment, I went down to the old kitchen. The first thing that happened is that, uh, you know, you, I couldn't be grumpy around Jennifer because she was so upbeat. So she ruined that mood <laughs> when I got there. Uh, and then I saw it. I saw what everybody who ever served down there sees. It was right in my face. I saw people very grateful for food. I saw uh, sadness, tears. Uh, uh, I saw poverty. I saw mothers with their children there uh, having a meal and then going back to the shelter because they're from an abusive home. And I saw myself as one of those children. I saw a small army of people, some of whom needed help themselves, helping other people. I, it, was, uh, it was quite a, a moment for me. Quite a, a connection, if you will. And when I went home that night, I, I, ate, I ate with some of the folks down there, too. And when I went home, I can't begin to tell you how grateful I was to have been in a place that I needed to be. Not necessarily what I gave them, but what they gave me, uh, instead of a place that I wanted to be. Uh, and I wept. Uh, and it was what I call in my life a Jesus moment. Uh, where I did see the light, and uh, uh, it meant quite a bit. And the second story is the same thing. It's just a little bit more powerful, and uh, I can't even go there right now, or I, I will lose it. So I'm going to wrap it up. I could not coalesce the significance of these stories that was my huge struggle. I just couldn't do it. There were too many moving parts. One morning last week, I got up at, uh, it was like 4.30, and it was clear to me, and I staggered into my den, and I wrote this down, what, uh, the, the significance of these stories, for me anyway. And I wrote this on a piece of scratch paper. I'm just going to read what I, uh, what I had, and it was as, as if it was handed to me. It says, most of the time, uh, perspective moments are only temporary. We get a little insight and intent, and almost immediately we're back at our trivial pursuits. Other times, however, they become Jesus moments. When there is such illumination, it becomes transformative. Your faith is converted to action. You find yourself going down the paths of gratitude, compassion, understanding, and service. These are the blessed moments in life. Now, I'd like to close with a prayer I learned <clears throat> from my foster father. It's my very favorite prayer. It's, it's a perfect prayer to me. It's uh, very brief, which is something that's important to me. And it's incredibly complete. And I'll, I'll recite it, and it goes like this. Accept our gratitude, dear Lord, for all the blessings thou dost give direct and guide our daily lives and teach us how to live for Jesus sake amen well that concludes our recorded portions of last week's service at our congregation at First Evangelical Lutheran Church in Mount Vernon we are an ELP